If you go into Google Maps and zoom all the way out, you will see a very familiar view of the world. Panning north, you see a very large Canada, nearly as big, if not bigger, than Africa. Greenland is a humongous landmass, bigger than all of China. And if you pan to the southern reaches of the map, you see an enormous Antarctica that seems to be the size of all other landmasses put together. And yet none of these sizes are accurate. Canada is actually half the size of Africa, Greenland is tiny compared to China, and Antarctica is not even larger than Africa, let alone the rest of the world's land mass. So, why does Google perpetuate such obvious errors? In fact, it's not Google's fault at all. They are merely displaying a Mercator projection, the standard way in which we view the world. However, this wasn't always the case, and it posed significant challenges for early navigators. Join us as we take a look back at the origins of the Mercator projection and why it was so important in a moment in history called the Mercator Atlas of 1569. During the age of discovery of the 15th century, the Portuguese discovered the sea route around Africa and on to Asia. Despite this great achievement, it took decades to accomplish. Their ships hugged the coast of Africa as they continued sailing farther south, every year reaching a new milestone. Only three other explorers headed west in a 30-year time frame. One of the reasons for the slow progress was the challenges in navigation. There were very few reliable maps. They were mostly elliptical and failed to account for the curvature of the Earth. To demonstrate in a simplified example, the red line here indicates a route the map would take a ship on, but ships prefer to sail in a constant course of direction, so in order to follow the map route, they must constantly recalculate their course, as shown here in yellow. Thus, long voyages were fraught with peril and carried great risks. In the day of GPS and satellite imagery, these accomplishments seemed trivial, but these feats were truly heroic as these ships sailed into the great unknown, virtually blind of what lay ahead of them. The heart of the issue was how to project a map from a three-dimensional globe to a two-dimensional flat piece of paper and still be accurate for navigation. There was a man who set out to solve this puzzle, but it would take him years of hard work to achieve, and at one point he barely escaped with his life due to his questionable work. In 1512, Gerhard Kremer was born into a family of a shoemaker. After his father's passing, Gerhard's uncle became his guardian. The uncle, an influential priest in the community, encouraged young Gerhard to follow in his footsteps. Gerhard was enrolled in a monastic school where all the teaching was in Latin. Here he would take a new Latin name, Gerardus Mercator, Mercator being the Latin translation of Kremer, meaning merchant. Mercator went on to study mathematics, geography and astronomy at the University of Leuven. Despite being a devout Christian, Mercator could not reconcile the conflicts between theology and the science behind the world he had observed. This made it difficult for him to continue studying theology. He later admitted, Since my youth, geography has been for me the primary subject of study. I liked not only the description of the earth but the structure of the whole machinery of the world. After graduating in 1532, he strayed from his uncle's prescribed path of priesthood and blazed a new course as an engraver, calligrapher and geographer. He made globes and scientific instruments and began to build his reputation. His globes were considered the finest in the world and many still exist today, but map-making was his true passion and the need for high-quality, accurate maps was dire. His first map was published at the age of 25, that of the Holy Land. A year later, he published his first world map in 1538. In his mapping endeavours, he travelled about and interviewed many fellow scholars for research. He collected hundreds of books and maps, and he corresponded with friars, merchants, travellers, statesmen and sailors in his thirst for geographical knowledge. However, this behaviour caused him suspicion from the Catholic authorities and the Inquisition. He, along with many of his university contemporaries, was arrested for suspicion of heresy, that of being a Protestant spy. 
Mercator spent seven months in prison while five of his fellow prisoners were executed. Luckily, he was released unscathed from lack of evidence. He had little to say about his imprisonment, only to mention that he was unjustly persecuted. To avoid further scrutiny from the Inquisition, Mercator moved his family to a more tolerant area in the Holy Roman Empire, and he resumed his map and globe-making enterprises. Over the ensuing years, he continued to gather geographical data from his widespread network of collaborators, including his son, stationed in London, to provide Gerardus Elizabethan news of discoveries. He published a map of Europe in 1554 and one of Great Britain in 1564. In 1569 came his crowning achievement, his map of the world, titled A New and More Complete Representation of the Terrestrial Globe, Properly Adapted for Use in Navigation. In later revisions, he would coin the term Atlas to describe his collection of maps, in honour of the Greek mythological figure Atlas, the first true geographer. Not only was the Atlas a remarkably thorough collection of current geographical knowledge, he also solved the sailor's dilemma, that of a ship's course of constant direction, called a rumb line, not corresponding to a straight line on their maps. This discrepancy would often send ships hundreds of miles off course without constant corrections. Mercator's solution was to make the scale of his map increase with latitude, in a way that the rumb lines were straight lines on his map. This allowed navigators to chart a course from the map and follow it exactly without the need for constant corrections. It made navigation much simpler and therefore safer. Mercator never divulged how he came about his projection, but others have reverse-engineered it and have many theories. A simple way to understand it is to imagine a paper cylinder wrapped around a globe and the map from the globe is projected onto the cylinder. When you unwrap the cylinder, you have basically a Mercator projection on a two-dimensional surface. Mercator continued to update and tweak his atlas up until his death in 1594. His sons and grandchildren published small revisions to the atlas, but the maps themselves were not updated. Shortly thereafter, the atlas began to wane in popularity, being replaced by more artistic and current map collections. With the Mercator family falling on hard times, they sold off the entirety of Gerardus's extensive library. In 1604, they sold the copper plates of the atlas to Jodicus Hondius. Hondius was a businessman who gave the atlas a new lease on life by adding missing maps, updating old ones, and removing Mercator's theological comments. This and subsequent revisions sold very well, but by the 1650s, the atlas had again run its course and fell into obscurity. One reason for this is that the Mercator projection was two centuries ahead of its time. Navigators were not able to use it to its full potential because it required ships to know their exact location. Determining longitude at sea was a vexing problem that wouldn't be solved until the mid-1700s, as I covered in episode 8. By the end of the 18th century, the Mercator projection found renewed interest once the position problem had been solved. It became the standard projection used in navigation, as well as commercial and educational maps. The widespread audience, however, voiced the obvious criticism of the projection. The increased latitude scale near the poles distorts the size of the land masses. However, the Mercator projection was never about accurate land depictions. It was for navigation, and in that regard it has done very well. Today, the Mercator is still used in marine charts, some world maps and web mapping services. Commercial applications have mostly replaced it with alternative, more modern projections. Despite falling out of favour, Mercator's original insight revolutionised navigation. His projection system standardised cartography and allowed sailors to accurately plot routes across the globe's oceans for the first time. This pivotal innovation fueled the age of discovery and helped connect distant lands. For the man who nearly lost his life to the ignorant and intolerant church, and who brought rigorous geometry to the intricate problem of world mapping, Mercator's legacy is assured. His name remains synonymous with the two-dimensional rendering that users instinctively comprehend as a map of the world. The insight, ingenuity 
and lasting impact of Mercator's 1569 Atlas secured his vision as the standard bearer that redefined global navigation, connectivity and understanding across the ages. Thank you for watching this moment in history. If you like this episode, please like and subscribe.